Hello, I am back and ready to uh, go ahead and go over our chapter one presentation here. Nope, that didn't work very well. Let me uh, do that. So chapter one is an overview chapter on WAN concepts. Uh, let's just get right in. I don't want this video to get too long. The first section here, uh, just general characteristics of wide area networks. At this point, we know that they operate over larger geographic areas, typically connecting multiple lands together. Uh, and most of the time, unless it's a pretty large corporation, uh, we're going to be using the services of a provider, which are obviously going to be for a fee. Uh, again, more general information on WANs. Of course, they're necessary. Um, without them, we wouldn't have any connectivity from LAN to LAN or any technology such as the Internet. Uh, there's several different topologies that, that exist within WANs. Uh, simplest would be a point-to-point, -point, as you can see here. Uh, hub and spoke is another very common one where you have a central location. Uh, but with virtualization and technologies like SD-WAN, uh, keep in mind that these can also be uh, logical topologies. So when we speak of things like meshes, partial mesh, you know, things of that nature, uh, modern technology like MPLS, SD-WAN have made those much cheaper and easier to implement uh, instead of doing everything physically. So full mesh, we know every site's connected to every other. Traditionally, when we were doing this with physical connections, uh, very cost prohibitive and not very doable. Uh, using virtual circuits and virtualization, you know, very doable at a fraction of the cost. Uh, the same thing goes with redundancy like you see here in the dual home topology. Uh, the chapter, if you're reading the content in the chapter, it's going to use a fictitious company called Span Engineering just to kind of have a use case as they go through the topics to apply it to this growing company and how they might utilize some of the technologies. So these next several slides are talking about, you know, the inception of the company being fairly small. And then as you, as you skip through, uh, the chapter and the presentation, you can see basically that they're growing, they're scaling their network, multiple locations to eventually becoming a global uh, company, which would obviously rely more on WAN technologies. Now, WANs operate at layers one and two of the OSI model. So we want to remember that. Uh, layer one, obviously physical layer, and then layer two, the data link layer. So th this is the area of the OSI model that we're focusing in on. And of course, there's several standards that apply TIA, EIA. We look at that mainly with structured cabling. Uh, IEEE, of course, has you know a multitude of standards that apply. Uh, for traditional WAN terminology, uh, let's take a minute to look at this. So essentially, if you look at this line that's right here, this line is called the demarcation or the demark. So this would be the customer's site, which is known as customer premise equipment, CPE. Uh, the service provider connecting device that's at the customer site, traditionally called a DCE, data communications equipment. Uh, the customer owned device that connects to that typically called DTE. Now uh, you'll recall DTE, DCE when we're uh, working with serial connections, say in Packet Tracer. So what we're doing there is emulating uh, this connection and then that would connect us to the actual service provider network. So as they show here, typically a router, a layer three switch. If there is a special device, like a modem or something of that nature, then that would be functioning as the DCE. The DMARC typically uh, determines what is the company's uh, responsibility to maintain versus what is the service providers. Now, the local loop is the connection 
between the customer site and the local switch or switching center or what they call the central office for the provider. And then of course from there, you can see we're gonna enter into the service provider network itself. So these are the traditional terminology used in uh, WAN, WAN labeling. And so there's some explanation of that um, a little more specifically. As far as WAN devices, um, obviously dial-up modems, pretty extinct, uh, but maybe used as a backup in an area where, you know, there's nothing better to use. Access servers, also kind of extinct. So broadband modems would be, you know, still commonly used. Uh, CSU, DSUs, these apply to digital lease lines like T carriers and could be external devices or integrated into the router. But again, lease lines, uh, not as common as they used to be. Of course, routers and multi-layer switches are going to be the most common WAN devices that we're going to uh, deal with. Circuit switching versus packet switching. Uh, circuit switched, notice in the diagram they're showing uh, traditional phones. Essentially, when a connection was made through the provider network, it always takes that same path between the two endpoints. So there's good and bad to that. The good is that reduces latency because it's always a set path. There's no decision making with the actual uh, routing devices or switches. But the downside of that is, of course, the fault tolerance. If there's an outage and any link in this path, then that connection's not there. So typical services that use circuit switching would be ISDN and the public switch telephone network. Packet switching is what all modern networking technologies are based on, uh, which is essentially that the router or the switch makes the determination about path in real time. So given you know, what the best metric is at that time or you know, quality of service or in the case of software defined networking, you know, what's being programmed there into the controller, the devices will make that determination in real time. So pretty much all modern network technologies are going to be packet switched. Selecting a WAN technology, you know, we've got this really nice chart here that kind of breaks out the traditional categories of WANs. So we got first on the private side, uh, dedicated lease lines, T carriers. On the switch side, the circuit switched would be, as I said, public switch telephone network, integrated services digital network, kind of a precursor to DSL. On the packet switch side of that, uh, Metro Ethernet, MPLS, frame relay, asynchronous transfer mode, and you could also add software defined networking to that. Public side of the WAN, uh, we have obviously VPNs using broadband, which would consist of DSL cable or wireless. Service provider network infrastructure uh, is going to vary widely. Uh, what they're really focusing in on here is more of the hardware level or what we call the underlay network, which are the physical parts of the network that actually move the traffic. So things such as sonnet rings uh, or SDH, uh, various fiber technologies like division wave, uh, let, me, let me think about this. Here we go, dense wavelength division multiplexing, which is essentially using different wavelengths of light pulses over the same fiber, which would drastically improve uh, throughput. Lease lines, I don't know if you're familiar with those. Uh, Traditionally, you know, this was how you connected sites. So you would pay a provider for a T1 or a T3. And essentially what you're paying for are multiplex uh, links. They use uh, multiplex channels of 64 kilobits per second. So a T1, for example, would be 23 multiplex channels, which gave you up to 1.544 megabits per second. Uh, as I said, these are going to be, you know, considered legacy connections at this point. Dial-up, enough said about that. In this day and age, it would 
uh, predominantly be is maybe a backup to remotely reach, you know, network devices like routers if the primary uh, network went down. Uh, ISDN, again, would be kind of a data technology that's been replaced by DSL. However, you know, you could still run into this in certain areas, uh, specifically the PRI type. So there's two basic types of ISDN, BRI, basic rate. Uh, essentially, it's called 2B plus D, two bare channels, which were for data at 64 kilobits per second, and then one D channel for signaling at 16K. This was, you know, competitive during the days of dial-up because you were looking at 128K in bandwidth versus, you know, 56 or, or slower. PRI essentially equivalent to a T1. So now we're looking at 23 bearer channels, each at 64K. We're looking at 1.5 meg, which obviously in today's uh, bandwidths that we need is not, not very good. Frame relay, NBMA network type. Um, essentially not going to be used much in the U.S., but could still be used abroad. We'll look at this um, in a little more detail, but using the idea of virtual circuits. So we're going to obviously have uh, more modern implementations of this type of thing using MPLS or SD-WAN. But this was kind of one of the first technologies that used the idea of virtual circuits through a cloud or through the provider's cloud. So we'll look at that. Uh, ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, back in the 90s, a very predominant network type and still, still used to some extent. Uh, the characteristic of ATM is it doesn't use frames like Ethernet. It uses smaller cells to transfer data. So we're going to get, you know, we're going to get essentially these used fiber underlay networks. Uh, using all the various OC ratings for network speeds. Ethernet WANs or Ethernet base WANs are obviously going to be the most predominant today. So, you know, Ethernet, if you look at probably for those of you that are working in IT and you're familiar with what type of internet connections your company's using, most would be Ethernet, you know, directly to your core, your core device. So this is going to be most commonly what we're going to see. Uh, MPLS, multi-protocol label switching. I did post a separate video under course videos in Canvas. Take a look at that video. It gives a little bit more insight at the sake of not getting this one too long. Um, but essentially MPLS, SD-WAN, software-defined WAN, I kind of look at it as an evolution of MPLS, a smarter version. But essentially, just real quick, we can connect to the provider's cloud through any type of connection, and we can implement, like I said, a full mesh with quality of service and all those type features that you're not going to get, say, in a VPN type connection. So view that video, which is very good as an overview for MPLS for MPLS. Uh, satellite technologies, so very small aperture terminal. Uh, again, with satellite, we're going to have a lot more latency, but in remote areas where there's no other options, you know, it is what it is. DSL still going to be used in some areas, especially small businesses, uh, both cable and DSL broadband. Um, DSL, keep in mind, is contingent upon distance. So the farther away the customer site is from essentially the DSLAM, which is a multiplexer, uh, the slower the speed. So there's different figures. You'll see uh, 18,000 feet, 25,000 feet. The point is the farther away, the slower the bandwidth. Cable, obviously still going to be a viable option. And obviously cable providers would also have other options like MPLS. SD WAN. Uh, when you look at that lab research assignment, uh, you'll run across that, I'm sure. Uh, just a quick search of Spectrum turned up that they do, in fact, you know, offer SD WAN services. 
but cable is going to be very common for small to medium-sized businesses. And then in more remote areas, of course, wireless, municipal Wi-Fi. Uh, WiMAX, not so common in the U.S. Um, I think Sprint was one of the last major providers to use WiMAX, but definitely municipal Wi-Fi or, you know, even private Wi-Fi using microwave or, or things of that nature. Uh, obviously, cellular, 4G for mobile connectivity. And, you know, when 5G infrastructure gets built out, of course, that will, will be utilized. VPNs, we know those are going to be widely used uh, even still. So site to site as well as remote access. Um, we'll look at VPNs in a separate section, separate chapter. So for now, at least be familiar with the two types. Choosing a WAN link connection, um, obviously there's lots of things to take into account, but what it really comes down to is what is available. Okay. So what's available in the area and what technologies do those providers offer? And it's really going to come down to that. So the rest of this is kind of looking at various questions to look at um, and things of that nature. So this is the lab I went over in the intro video. Um, like I said, you don't got to worry about filling out the charts in full. All I really want you to do is research two or three local providers, regional providers, and just simply list what you know technologies that they offer and we'll leave it at that so for this week we're going to complete the WAN research assignment okay I want you to watch the introduction video if you haven't done that already and then go ahead and reply to the discussion questions on canvas uh, watch the two videos posted under course videos on canvas as well one is an overview of MPLS the second one is an overview of SD-WAN. And then for this chapter, the only other thing will be taking the chapter one exam. Uh, so I'll be back at you in chapter two. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, don't hesitate to contact me uh, in any means that I've made available. I'll see you next time. Stay safe. Stay healthy.